Good afternoon, everyone. Kerasoft Technology would like to welcome you to our ServiceNow Federal Tech Talk, IT Operations Management Visibility. Joining us today from ServiceNow, we have Andrew Shearer, Solution Sales Executive, and Christian Malone, Principal Solution Architect. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Heather, thank you. Um, I will, uh, I too will turn on my video. Uh, usually I have a face for radio, but we'll give this a try. Um, Okay, well, I'm just going to jump right in and, and, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully this may take a full hour, it may not, but we'll, we'll jump in and please, as, as Heather said, any questions you may have, uh, please let us know and, and we'll try to make sure we get everything answered. So, so good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the latest in our Tech Talk, tech talk webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing ServiceNow's ITOM visibility solution. We're gonna break up the webinar into two parts. Mine will be the first voice you hear as I provide a relatively brief overview of the solution. And once that's over, I'm gonna turn it over to Christian to walk us all through an actual demo of the product. So as many of you may have guessed by now, my name is Andrew Shearer. I am a solution sales executive supporting the federal government. Um, I support something that we call the technology workflows. Technology workflows um, are in, for ServiceNow are comprised of ITOM, which is our IT operations management solution, which we're going to talk about today. Um, ITAM, which is our asset management solution, which is made up of our software asset management, our hardware asset management, and very recently, an enterprise asset management. And finally, our SPM product, which is our strategic portfolio management, which is um, project portfolio management, agile, those types of things. With me today is Christian Malone. Christian is our principal solution architect for federal technology workflows. And Chris, Christian has over 25 years of, of experience in technology, including data center, cloud, SaaS. And prior to working for ServiceNow, Christian was actually a customer, which gives him keen insight into the customer experience. Uh, in fact, Christian's experience with ServiceNow spans an impressive 15 releases. Uh, dating back to Eureka. Uh, if you don't know how we name releases, uh, they're named after large cities alphabetically. So today, for instance, we're in the Tokyo release, uh, which followed the San Diego release, which followed Rome and Quebec, uh, Paris, et cetera. Um, so you can see if Christian's been around since Eureka, that's E, uh, he's been around a long time. So I can honestly say that every time that I hear uh, a demo or I see Christian give a presentation, I, I also learn something. So I'm excited about that as well. So with that, I'm going to jump right in and let's get cooking. All right. So let's talk about the agenda. Good news. We're already ahead of the, ahead of the game because we've already done our start and intros. Uh, next, after the agenda, I'm going to do a brief conversation about the ServiceNow platform as a whole. Um, I think it's helpful to have a general idea of the scale and the scope um, of ServiceNow offerings and how does, in this case, ITOM visibility fit into that broader picture. From there, we're going to walk through ITOM visibility specifically. And then, as I said, Christian is going to walk us through a demo of the actual product and we'll sprinkle in answering questions and you know, if we need to, we'll, we'll answer a bulk of the questions at the end. Okay, so this is a holistic view of the entire ServiceNow platform. And more specifically, as I mentioned, I think this is a really good illustration of the scale and the scope of the Now platform. Now, uh, many of my colleagues, many of my peers, uh, uh, they don't show this slide. Why? Because it's, they say it's too busy or it's too crowded or it's too dense or it's too overwhelming. It's, you know, add an adjective after the word too, um, right? And so they say it's just, it's, it's not something they want to try to go through. But the reason I use this slide is actually because of those things. Because to me, the busyness shows in stark detail the breadth of solutions that ServiceNow provides across the entire enterprise. Right? And so the reason that ServiceNow can provide the level of service and solutions across a myriad of different products across your entire estate is the fact that each of these solutions uses a common single language, each uses a common single architecture, and each uses a common single data model that ultimately allow our customers to connect to the people, departments, and processes across their entire 
entire enterprise. So today we're going to be focused on ITOM. And ITOM is a very powerful product. And it's really foundational to the ServiceNow platform. But as you can see, it's just a piece of the Now platform. And the value of our platform to our customers grows exponentially with implementation of additional products. It's that idea of one plus one equals three. So before we jump into ITOM visibility, I, I'd like to start from the beginning and discuss both the importance of an enterprise CMDB and the importance of auto-populating the CMDB as opposed to manually maintaining it. The CMDB is your organization's digital foundation and is the foundation of the ServiceNow platform as well. It's that central repository of configuration items, things like servers and user compute devices, routers, firewalls. Um, and the CMDB holds the data needed to drive the outcomes from a customer's transformational goals. Remember, the value of a CMDB increases as the accuracy of the data increases, right? Or conversely, bad data creates a CMDB that's not terribly useful, right? It's the idea of garbage in, garbage out. So to ensure that the CMDB has the necessary context and remains healthy and trustworthy, we recommend as a best practice populating it in an automated fashion. And to do this, we recommend ITOM visibility. Auto population allows not only for near real-time updates, but also the most up-to-date, most accurate data set possible. It's through this auto population that ITOM visibility provides the fastest time to value as a customer gains visibility of their entire operational state, right? Conversely, manually populating is going to lead to inaccurate, unreliable data that ultimately is gonna turn into poor decisions. And we all know it's not because the decision maker is not up for the job, it's because the data that the decision maker is relying on is flawed. Again, it's the axiom of garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so if we can agree that it's best practice is to auto-populate the CMDB, how do we do it, right? ServiceNow Discovery, again, part of the visibility solution, discovers your entire IT infrastructure, creating an accurate and up-to-date record in your CMDB. It discovers both physical and logical components, virtual machine, server storage. You're gonna hear me oftentimes laundry list these things. And the reason I do it is because just to really um, emphasize all the different things that the CMDB is bringing in, right? So we're gonna see logical components, virtual machines, servers, storage, databases, applications. So discovery goes out, finds the various infrastructure components and returns each unique record back to the CMDB in the form of a CI or a configuration item. Now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth into what this, what this slide is showing, but I do wanna break it down from a, from a high level, right? So this slide is breaking down discovery into four stages, uh, the four colored boxes, right? Scan, classify, identify, and exploration. And just briefly, let me tell you what those are. Scan is, this is where we're going to go out and scan an IP range, right? And give us a slash 24 that you want us to look at or, uh, or a slash 28 or slash, whatever, the, whatever the IP range you want us to go out. We'll go out and scan those IPs going and finding um, different, different CIs that are on there. So classify says, hey, we found something. What is it? We got to classify this. Is it a server? Okay, it's a server. Is it a Windows server? Is it a Linux server? What is it? And once we've classified it, then we identify, it. hey, is this already in our CMDB? And, and that's really key, right? Because we don't wanna, if, if we're gonna continually do these probes, we don't wanna do something, we don't wanna keep bringing back all this data that we've already put into the CMDB, right? So if the identify uh, probe and the identify uh, stage, what it's doing is it's, it's seeing if this is a unique um, CI or if there's already this, if this already exists into the CMDB. And then finally, exploration. This is reading that CI for the detailed information, like CPU usage, serial number, uh, whatever the case may be, taking that data and then sending it back to the ServiceNow instance and, and auto-populating the CMDB. Now, I've talked about auto-population and discovery and sending a probe out and, and, and going, in, a, in, a, in an automated function. And 
it's, it's very important, right? And it's very important that that's how we, we, just, we, we build out your CMDB with the most reliable data. But we also understand, ServiceNow understands that customers, you know, you've invested both time and money into other existing tools that may contain important CMDB information. So to have the most complete CMDB available, working with industry, you know, working with, with third-party companies, ServiceNow has created various what we call service graph connectors, which are standardized way to ingest data into the CMDB and make it easily accessible in our platform. So these connectors round out discovery and significantly add to the overall completeness of the CMDB, which is, which is what we want, right? So this slide is showing you how a customer would use both, right? Discovery's on the right-hand side. We've got the mid-server, it's going out, it's, it's probing all these different areas, it's bringing it back into the CMDB. On the left-hand side, you've got a service graph connector that is, is being used with third-party tools to bring that information into the CMDB. So for example, uh, a customer might use just uh, ServiceNow Discovery to discover one's data center or cloud estate, and then use the service graph connector for SSEM or JAMF to bring in um, CMDB data for, for endpoints, for end user compute devices, for example. Finally, when discussing discovery, it's important for us to mention that ServiceNow can use either agentless or agent-based discovery. So this, I mean, gee whiz, uh, agent-based and agentless, we could go through this for, you know, this could be a, a seminar on its, a webinar on its own. So I'm going to be very high level, but it's just to illustrate that that regardless of your requirements, whether it's agentless um, uh, or agent-based, we can do it. In fact, I've got a, I've got a customer that's using both. Right, they're in. They're doing it in a hybrid. They've got some part of the discovery going through agent list, some part of it going through our agent client collector or ACC. And our ACC, we'll talk about on the next slide. But this slide, this is showing you um, uh, agent list discovery. And so, from a high level perspective, ServiceNow, we use something called a mid server. Mid server stands for man management information and discovery server, which is just a lightweight Java app that sits on a customer's network. And its job, the, the mid-server's job, is to query the ServiceNow instance and say, hey, you know, and, and the ServiceNow instance says, hey, go run these probes, right? We talked about the different phases uh, in a couple slides before, right? So go run these probes and collect the resulting data. Once the data is collected, the mid-server sends the information back to the CMDB um, in the ServiceNow cloud over port 443, right? And so that satisfies the security and firewalls team. So this, these mid-servers continually interrogate network devices looking for any changes. Again, allowing for that CMDB to be as real time as possible. The value again of, of auto population and constantly interrogating and, and looking for the Delta that's out there um, in your environment. And again, ServiceNow, we're gonna use both agentless and agent. So. So the last slide talked about agent. This is gonna talk about agent-based. Again, very high level. Um, if you have questions about this, uh, we can take it offline and we can go into it in much further detail, but agent-based discovery, right? We use embedded agents on host systems. So in this slide, it's talking about, you know, our Windows device or a Linux device or a Mac OS device. And those agents send information back to the mid-server. And then the mid-server sends it back out to ServiceNet. And so our agent client collector does not require host credentials, which agentless does, or need to open inbound firewall ports. Because if you look at this diagram, you can see that any, any conversation from the mid server to service now is all one way. It's all outbound, nothing inbound. So this simplifies deployment and makes the agent client collector or ACC ideal for implementing zero trust environments. And again, I mentioned them both just so that you know that ServiceNow um, is flexible and we can use one versus the other or a hybrid of the two. Okay. All right, so we've talked about the CMDB. We've talked about the importance of discovery and auto population. Again, it's foundational to the digital transformation journey. Um, it's down foundational to our platform. And so now we want to review an equally important component of ITOM visibility, and that's making our CMDB something called service aware. And service aware is done through something called the service mapping. Okay, service mapping 
builds on the discovered in for the discovered data, um, and it automatically creates an end-to-end -end map of your application and technical services. It identifies all the CIs that support the service, along with their specific, um, uh, along with their specific business service. So I see there's a question. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get through this slide. It's another two minutes, and then I'll we'll we'll look to the question if that's okay with everybody. So once we identify the hardware, software, visualization, storage, um, it's then mapped to the corresponding business service. And when we say something like business service or service mapping, a business service for us is an application that an end user or, or a customer might interact with, right? And then when you take that business service mapping and you overlay it on top of your discovery, you really do have a 360 degree view of what's going on in your environment. Now, for me, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I just gave you a lot of words up there to describe service mapping. But I think this slide actually is my favorite slide. Uh, I think this, this, this is a good summation of everything I've talked about for the last several minutes. In fact, going forward, maybe I'll just do this slide and save, save everybody some time. But what you can see here, what's showing here now is this is the, the first column is showing discovery, right? These are the devices that we've gone out and we've discovered by type. So there's load balancers, web servers, et cetera, you can re read them down. This is our discovery. The second column is something called dependency matching, mapping. And this allows us to determine which load balancers are connected to which web servers, down to which databases, which physical servers, et cetera. This is sort of that, you know, the, the hip bones connected to the leg bones, connected to the shin bone, connected to the foot bone, right? This connects all of the different, um, pieces of uh, CIs that are in the, in the uh, CMDB. Now it's the third column that really makes our, our CMDB service aware because what the third column is doing is it's drilling down to the level of service. So let's talk, um, let's use email, right? That's a business service um, everybody, everybody's aware, you know, everybody's familiar with. So in this example, what we're saying is that that the email system is sitting on that particular load balancer. And that particular load balancer is connected to those particular web servers and connected to those particular app servers, right? So this is a true breakthrough in the discovery and mapping process. Today in many IT environments, IT staff have to sit down with multiple stakeholders, gather tribal knowledge, and then construct these service maps, oftentimes by hand. They typically have to go through multiple iterations uh, to generate an accurate map, and, and the process has to be repeated every time there's a change. Um, I have a customer right now, they've got over 1,500 business services. Imagine trying to do a service mapping by hand for 1,500 uh, services. It would take you an inordinate amount of time, and it would be stale the moment that it was done because you know, it's not, it's not real time. It's not auto-creating, auto-populating. So to sum it up, we've talked about the platform. We've talked about the importance of the CMDB. We've talked about the value of discovery. We've talked about how we can augment discovery with service graph connectors. And we've talked about the incredible value of making the CMDB service aware. So with that, Let's, let's look into the question, um, and then I'm going to turn it, after we answer the question, I'll turn it over to Christian so he can walk you through the demo that's going to provide real-life um, context to what I just discussed. So with that, I'm going to click on the Q&A. Oh, sure. That's an easy answer. Yep. We can get you, uh, we are going to, uh, we'll get, uh, I'll get the slides out to um, Heather, and she can get it out to the, to the list of folks. All right. So with that, Christian, um, uh, do you want to take yep. take control here? All right. Sure, we'll do. I was actually going to cover this other uh, question that came up in the meantime, which is about okay, how sure. will dependency and service mapping be done? Uh, is it automatically or through manual means? And actually, that's what we'll demonstrate. Uh, there are many different ways to get to a service where seem to be. So we'll try to cover a few different options. Uh, let's, uh, let's see if I can share my screen and start. With, uh, with some outcomes. So uh, what I wanted to do first before we get into IT operations management visibility uh, product is really to talk about what is the expectation after you finish? So, you know, sometimes as we demonstrate, you know, if you're an administrator, if you actually are, are working within IT operations management, maybe as a discovery admin or a server a service uh, 
uh, service mapping admin, then obviously we're gonna start with those workspaces. But I like to start with, well, what's the expectation if we do a good job? What, what would actually be different for anybody that's using ServiceNow? So, uh, so give me just a few moments here. I wanna show a couple workspaces. For example, the software asset management overview. Common outcome, we get to a ITOM visibility that automates our CMDB. What we're doing then is not just having servers, not just having desktops in the CMDB, but we're also bringing in the installed software. That's a part of that process. Uh, regardless of how I'm bringing that data in, if my goal is to have a software asset management dashboard like this provide data, I'm going to want to have those uh, devices, those, those CIs, those configuration items in the CMDB. I'm going to want related lists that include the installed software. That's why we bring that in natively with our agent, with our discovery, or with uh, uh, some of our service graph connectors. And then our software man asset management team is going to get their entitlements. And that gives you that Venn diagram, what actually is in my network, what actually is installed on those servers and laptops, what from an entitlement perspective am I allowed to? And that Venn diagram gives you this dashboard here. So IT operations management visibility, if done right, is going to light this up for you. Take that a step further and actually take that from a, a larger perspective. Maybe enterprise architect is looking at lifecycle. Uh, we have hardware and software that makes up our, our critical services. That's what this view is here from a TPM or technology portfolio management view. Uh, I can look at my services. That's how this is uh, listed out here. Within those services, I have application services that are running software. As you can see here, I have software models that are applied to those, uh, hardware models that are applied to those. Uh, and in this case, what I'm doing is looking at that TRM lifecycle as well, overlaying that. And what we can see here is a dashboard that shows us what's our end of life date, either from a, a lifecycle perspective, um, you can enter them in yourself if you wanna have a, a, a date that you, you have certain hardware models go stale. At that point, we can start to make some decisions and create a project that says maybe uh, because this is gonna be out of date, there's a risk to that lifecycle, uh, we'll go ahead and, and kick up a project to move that to the cloud, for example, rather than updating this hardware since it's already out of life. Again, a healthy seem to be not only that, but a service aware seem to be is helping me to provide this because I'm not going to upgrade all of the hardware models necessarily the same. The hardware models that are part of critical services might be handled differently than the ones that are part of non-critical services. So bringing this back down to a very simplistic ITSM, IT service management example, is a change. Uh, this is a, a great example. Uh, because when we do changes, we're changing things in our environment. So let's say that I'm changing an application or a server, and I want to be able to identify what's the impact from that. You know, this first phase, if you're completing your IT uh, operations management visibility project, is that I want to list. So if I come here to configuration items, and I'm going to say these are the things that I'm changing, we'll start with one, and then in the affected CIs, I could add more. Uh, I might have a lot of things. I only have 14,000 here. A lot of our customers are going to have hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions here, because you've done a good job with the seem to be representing your environment. So what we might wanna do is leverage some of the metadata that's in the seem to be as well. So we're augmenting IT operations management visibility with seem to be to be able to give us these metadata fields like who supports this. What location is this then? Is this production, prod, QA, et cetera? And I use a simple one of, uh, one of the support groups is one of my groups, i.e. return back all the things that I own. And that 16,000 or so went down to 16. You know, in your environment, this might be still hundreds, but then I would go through and say, just show me production, just show me production in this data center, just show me these classes. This helps me to identify when I wanna to add to this change. That's that for sort of first step, that inventory I have in my seem to be uh, configuration items that can be selected in changes, or they could be added in incidents. Uh, in this case, I'm one step further because it's actually an Oracle software or in this case, what we call an application running on a server. So this also means I have an application dependency mapping seem to be as well. I, have, I know applications that are running the servers, i.e. I know what the server's purposes are. So adding this change to get to the next fa phase, set logs to verbose. I'm not gonna do a full change demo here. I just wanna say, you know, as we save it, um, automatically it would refresh this impact services at one of those stages. And uh, what that allows us to do is to identify what's the impact. Uh, again, I could add additional CIs, maybe I'm changing an entire rack or a whole type of model or uh, all the software related to a service. Uh, but whether I have that in the primary CI or I have that down here, we're gonna run that behind the scenes and identify for you, hey, that's going to change not just the application, but it's also gonna change this service or these services that are impacted. This gives me, again, that foundational seem to be populated by ITOM visibility that now we're seeing users gain some value because they're able to put in a change for what they're actually changing and identify who's impacted by those changes 
And obviously you could automate this so that those owners of those services could get a nice uh, courtesy email. They could even add be added as approvers, for example. So nobody's changing anything in the environment without having people approve it that might be impacted by it. So just to take this one extra step, you know, rather than taking a change for something, let's say we have a health status dashboard, we're overlaying now, uh, just like we overlaid entitlements to get to a software asset management outcome. Now we're overlaying alerts over top of that service aware seem to be. So now rather than looking at a service health dashboard like this, that would just be a list of alerts coming in. Uh, we actually have doing that work for you. If I go and click in one of these critical services, I can actually see a service map. This is what we mean by service aware seem to be. This is what, uh, what Andy was showing earlier. I have not only individual servers, but I also have applications that are running on those servers. Again, same thing as I showed in the change. This takes us one step further because I wanna know where those applications are connected to each other. Uh, this starts by understanding not just the service name, who owns the service, maybe who might approve that service, but it also has to be what entry points are we using to get into that service, i.e. how do users actually interact with that service? And then we automate that process by going through identifying as we traffic this uh, uh, through the different applications, identify through either configuration management files that we're reading from or traffic that's shown between these applications and services. We'll build this map free automatically. And then once when it's approved, you're able to, in this case, as you can see, overlay alerts against it, as we saw earlier, technology lifecycle, et cetera. So what, these are one of the outcomes. If we dive a little bit deeper into an alert, for example, we also leverage that service awareness in other ways. So uh, an operator here that sees that there's a, a, in this case, a group of alerts. We're grouping those alerts together from multiple monitoring systems because we have a service aware seem to be. And that means that some alerts are coming in maybe on the service, some are coming in on the application, some are coming in on the configuration item, but we understand they're a part of that relationship and we can group those together meaningfully. And then we also go one step further is you can look at our probable root causes we can look at things like changes and other alerts. Again, based on the relationship, you can see the reasoning here, there was a change on this application service. Even if some of these alerts are coming in on the server, for example, we know that relationship. If I open up that change, in this case, it's an automated change. Yes, I hand wrote one a moment ago. I really hope that you're moving towards uh, like DevOps, for example, integrating automatic changes that are being created via API into your, uh, if you have automated pipelines and, and deployments. And we also have a new feature in Tokyo, which is really great, our latest release, where we extend this DevOps capabilities to look at more deeply config changes. ITOM, or IT Operations Management Visibility, allows us to see config files that we track, and we can tell you whether that config file changes. Uh, but we sort of do that as a whole level. The file has changed or it hasn't, here's the diff. What we're doing now within our DevOps config is actually diving into a much more uh, detailed view. Uh, if I take example of this, Here's a config uh, snapshot from software or hardware. Doesn't matter what it is. We break that apart, as you can see here, into individual items. And then we also have policies that can run against it. So just giving you an idea, again, that foundational seem to be is now enhanced by snapshots of your configs in this case that you can run policies against. And that can help you from a DevOps perspective know whether something should or shouldn't get deployed and allows you to have smarter deployments in that case. So just to break this down to that server that we're talking about, yes, obviously configuration items still have fields. Um, we're able to see that here. This is our service operations workspace. So it's sort of a curated view. <clears throat> we do still have uh, our traditional form that you can view and a dashboard and a list view as well. So there's lots of different ways to see this. Obviously we have key attributes that are uh, for those CIs. So that would be operating system, manufacturer, model, et cetera. Um, that's gonna include also relationships. And if we look at related records, it would be all of those related you know, configuration items, network adapters, software installed, running processes, all of those other tables that reference back to this so that we can support a many to one. So everything's still there as you expect in the seem to be. And again, all of this is being populated by automated where possible. So again, operating system is going to be automated. We don't want that to be manual. There'll be other fields here though, like ownership. Those are going to be things that you might want to um, identify through uh, your attestation processes in the CMDB. To go out to those relationships and show that, service where CMDB means that I normally have, as I've said earlier, a server like this Windows server, the infrastructure that it runs on, so VMware, and I would have a bunch of infrastructure underneath of that, it's network adapter, it's disk, et cetera. But I also have, as I shown an earlier, application dependency mapping, Oracle is running on this Windows server. And as we get beyond that, Oracle connects to what other applications, and that gets us all the way through as we go up through here to a order status, which is our, our service. 
This is the behind the scenes view of what we showed in a more simplistic way with this service health dashboard and, um, and this service map view here. So with that, I'm gonna hop into how did we actually get there? You know, those are the outcomes. That's what you would expect to see with a healthy seem to be populated via ITOM or IT operations management visibility. How we get there is to start with brand new seem to be workspace. I'm gonna start with this just because this has uh, some governance. Obviously you'd be coming back to this as you mature through your uh, population of the seem to be through IT operations management visibility. We've added a few new features here. Uh, this is brand new in Tokyo. Uh, seem to be workspace now has intelligent search. This is really exciting. This allows you if I click on the search tips here, for example, to do not only a single table search, go show me all of these applications or all these servers, but I can also do a multi-table search show me all of the services that run on Linux servers. So it's a more friendly, uh, natural language way that you can type it in. And then behind the scenes, we identify what it is that you're trying to search for. Uh, and then we make recommendations based on that. Um, we can do much more advanced filtering and we can do relationships as well. So look through this. I think this is absolutely great. We have had this in some degree up in the top search. We now put it right here in the CMDB workspace. Uh, and there's some great search starts here that you can use. Uh, one of the interesting ones I found is show me all the servers that have log4j uh, software running. You know, that would be a great search if we, you know, everybody had that a couple months ago. As we look through the seem to be workspace, it is showing us what new CIs we have. Again, those would be populated via uh, visibility, ITOM visibility, uh, new hardware, new applications, new application services, an overview of not just the over, uh, overall classes, but I can also click on my CIs and see specifically maybe what I own. Uh, quick links out to anything that you need. And then we can drop into governance where we'll see attestation that's done. That means as a data manager or administrator, you'll set tasks that identify who should be validating data. So that's important. Discovery will go out and identify, pull in that data automatically, but we do want somebody to actually validate that it's correct, especially those fields that are non-discoverable, like is it production or prod, is it QA, um, maybe your life cycle. And then we have another three, what we call seem to be 360, which is wonderful. This is where we bring in uh, data sources from many different sources. It could be from our horizontal discovery, which I'll show in a moment. Could be from our agent, which I'll show in a moment. Could be service graph connectors. And we reconcile those all together. So that's what this dashboard is really about. This view will show us, for example, um, anything that's, uh, that's not reported in our first tab here. Uh, anything that has a mismatch, anything that, um, uh, has been reconciled, for example. And this gives us a discovery source overview. So in this case, in my instance, I have ServiceNow populating a lot of configuration items, but I also have SCCM and I have service graph connectors from several other sources as well. So the hope is that you move and mature from an inventory seem to be to a service aware seem to be to a multi data source aware seem to be. And that's my term for saying that we're taking in multiple sources, maybe from endpoint management, from security, from monitoring. And that's helping us to identify if we have any gaps in the discovery that we do. Um, it also allows us to maybe publish back to them and show them what gaps they have. When I was a customer, I had lists going out every week to security and out to monitoring, showing them what they had gaps, because again, I was getting a feed of their data through these. Uh, and again, I thank them for filling in my gaps so I know what I didn't know. Maybe go back to ServiceNow, add an additional uh, discovery. And then even if I got partial records from them, I could still then identify where ServiceNow needed to go and do a, a deeper dive discovery um, or add an agent. So really great here in a management tab that you can go into as well. So let's get into how horizontal discovery works. What do we mean by that? Horizontal discovery is, for example, I'm on this discovery home page here and I might set up schedules. So let's do that to start with. I would simply add a schedule. That schedule could be cloud or IP based. Um, I have several schedules that are already created here. Let's go to one that was created for a Tokyo data center, for example. Um, and once when that schedule is, has been populated with IP, uh, generally you're gonna use larger subnets. Um, you can manage that. Um, you can import those subnets in via discovering your sw uh, switches, which will actually pull the um, switch route tables in and auto-populate. If you do a cloud discovery, um, you can identify uh, your cloud API that you wanna go AWS, for example, and as we do a discovery, we'll pull in the cloud networks and that will also populate the IPs that need to be discovered. So many different ways to do that. But once when those IPs are discovered, as Andy said, we go through that process of uh, checking that IP. Um, is it active or not? If it's active, we do a, a scan to see what management protocol ports are open. If we identify certain pr uh, 
port protocols that are open, then we understand this might be Linux, this might be Windows, this might be SNMP, storage, network, et cetera. And then we run some identification to run and essentially ask, what are you specifically? What version are you? Once we understand exactly what class it is and exactly what version it is, then we have patterns that will run. Those patterns will go in and actually identify specifically what it is, go through a whole list and uh, pull back information, explore different types of information, bring it back and then populate that into the CMDB. Super easy to troubleshoot. Um, the pattern uh, walks through a series of steps. And so anytime you're in a schedule like this and you see some errors or something else that you wanna identify a little further, you just click the button that says, hey, let's open up the pattern viewer. And it allows you to walk step-by-step step and show what command did we run? What results did we get back? What happened from that? So really excited about that, very easy to use. Uh, something new that uh, we're starting to see a lot more uh, customers build upon is what happens if we don't have a pattern? What happens if we don't understand necessarily all the applications you're leveraging in your environment? Well, we have what we call here application fingerprints. This is leveraging machine learning and AI and our building uh, across all, our, all of our customer sets, what we think might be noise and what we think might be helpful. We make recommendations here. So in this case, you can see after I've run discovery, um, in addition to all of the applications that are brought in and populated because we have patterns for them, we also have this list of saying, well, maybe based on some running processes, I'm recommending 101 application servers and 874 potential applications. You can walk through this list. You can then for each one, if you wanted to simply click create an application and it's gonna automate the process. Uh, in the past, we used to have to do this by hand by going to create a class, create a process classifier, tie that back to the class, create a pattern, tie all that together. And now with one click, it does all that for you. So again, sometimes here, you're gonna be able to ignore some of these. They're not gonna be critical applications that you need to track. Some of these can be left behind as simply software that's installed that you'll track with software asset management, but where you look through this list and it makes a recommendation of an application that you do agree is critical. Again, it simplifies that step to one button, create the application, sets together a pattern for you. And then if you wanna go in and identify additional data, version information, et cetera, uh, probably just a couple steps to add to that pattern. And you can pull in additional information as well for it, just like we do with our out of the box patterns. We're building upon this, by the way, um, in service mapping, for example, to say if we can automatically recommend applications, what could we do in addition to that? So I'll show that to you in a few moments as well. So how do we actually get that data if we're not gonna do horizontal discovery? Now, again, horizontal discovery and the top-down discovery that, uh, that uh, can sit on top of that is still the best method. We do have uh, the most feature sets with that, but we also have the ability for you to download what we call our ACC or agent client collector. As you can see here, very simple screen that you have in your instance that says what kind of operating system are you running? And then you can click these to go ahead and download those uh, packages. Um, and you can obviously put these through your uh, config management. Uh, process as well. If you have some way to automate the process of agent deployment and configuration. After those agents are deployed, we have a health page that will pop up and show you. In this instance, I don't have too many, but we can support many, many, many agents. They report back to mid servers. So imagine a mid server, which is a Java application that we provide you that you can download on one of your servers, for example, in your data center or in your cloud. Uh, that does the horizontal discovery. In this case, with an agent, it simply reverses that and that you have an agent on an end user device, uh, be it a laptop, desktop, server, and it would communicate by itself as an agent back to the mid server. The mid server then communicates back to our ServiceNow instance in much the same way that it does with horizontal discovery. So some example, this is one of those agents, for example, I just wanted to show you some of the checks that we have here uh, out of the box uh, that we're checking for, whether it's cloud, et cetera. I do like this first one, as you can see here, there are some application checks as well. So if we identify some applications that are running on that service. We have some of those, we'll be expanding that out in the future as well. But lots of different checks that might run and identify what should be gathered. We're obviously gathering all the standard metrics as well, uh, and we can provide alerts on these as well. So one agent can not only grab uh, uh, our seem to be information, it can also grab software utilization. So you might be using something else that, for that today. If you feel like that feature is getting deprecated, ServiceNow can take over grab that software utilization, you can identify has somebody actually opened that uh, software in a period of time, software metering. Uh, and then we also are able to pull health data. So uh, as you can see with our checks here, uh, and then we're also able to grab logs as well. So you can do log analysis, for example, on servers as well, all built into one agent. To expand that a little bit more, maybe you're a more modern uh, uh, shop, maybe you have some parts of your organization that are more modern and they're starting to do container-based. 
for those organizations that are container-based rather than having a uh, Linux or Windows agent that sits on it. Obviously, that's going to be a little bit too heavy for it. Rather than doing a horizontal discovery, we have what we call cloud-native operations. This gives us the ability to actually place a mid-server into that, for example, Kubernetes environment um, or uh, Kubernetes as a service through AWS or Azure. That allows us to pull back data, not just about that environment, but also pull back some event data and health data as well. Uh, and that's really great. So whether you are a physical on-prem data center uh, and we're doing horizontal discovery, whether you have agents on your compute, whether you are in the cloud or we're pulling cloud discovery, whether you are modern and uh, refactored applications and we're leveraging container discovery like this, um, all that data is gonna come back. I wanted to show you an example for this Kubernetes. <clears throat> Our Kubernetes dashboard, after you deploy that cloud native operations, uh, you'll end up with data coming back and populating this dashboard. This is going to show us all of our Kubernetes clusters, namespaces, nodes, pods, et cetera. And then what's nice is that we build upon this to query not just Kubernetes, but if you have a service mesh, for example, we'll query that. We'll be able to pull back the relationships of those, uh, let's say, microservices, those containers, and automatically build a service map as well. So that's one way to, to when you're moving from on-prem to containers, uh, to maintain that same service-aware CMDB that you want. So speaking about service mapping, uh, brand new feature. I'm a, such a fan of this. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, this is our new service mapping workspace. Uh, this builds upon all the work that we've done in the beginning. Uh, this also builds upon what we were just showing with application uh, fingerprinting. This takes it one step further. We actually create application service candidates. Really love this. Um, in addition to the readiness that you can do to see whether or not you have uh, done all the prerequisites or if you have any errors or best practice issues with preparing for doing service mapping. Once when that's uh, all green light ready to go, We'll have candidates that get populated here. As we can read here, it uses our uh, machine learning algorithm on our platform to discover traffic and suggest candidates. Uh, if we click on one of these, for example, um, one of our Redis uh, more modern uh, applications, I can preview that map. Uh, this is really exciting because what ends up happening is rather than creating an application service and seeing what it might be, we can click a preview button and it'll actually build out a sample map using that data so we can identify, does this look like something that's going to be uh, beneficial for us? And in this case, there we go, we have a Prometheus uh, and then we have several containers that are supporting that as well. So this would be a great example where I could go back, simply click that button to say, create application. And then as I showed earlier with application fingerprinting, this will automate a lot of that process that it's gonna happen after you create the application service, it will go and actually pull through all of that, create that, that map, um, and then you can send it off for approval and it would be available in all those outcomes that I showed earlier. Final way to automate the building of your foundational seem to be data is what we call service graph connectors. This comes along, as I said earlier, managing from uh, your maturity from an inventory seem to be to a service aware seem to be to a multi data source aware seem to be. Service graph connectors allow me to build on top of that horizontal discovery, that agent discovery, that container based discovery, and bring in these, uh, these data sources from, again, mostly endpoint monitoring, uh, security monitoring, et cetera. Uh, this is a really great uh, seem to be integration dashboard that I can leverage along with the seem to be workspace. Uh, this allows me to look through all the different data that's coming through, how it's being processed, if I have any errors. Uh, and we have other dashboards that allow you to reconcile this uh, and look to see if there's any issues. Uh, going back to that seem to be workspace, same thing there with the, uh, uh, with the issues that allows us to identify if there are any uh, CIs, for example, that are coming in through some uh, data sources, but not available in others. And that's essentially how I did my work as a customer to identify those gaps between different types of data sources and identify if something stale. If it's stale, is that a connection problem or is that actually something that should be automated maybe into a request to the user? Is this actually retired? Should this come off the network? Should we do some workflow to, to process the end of this life cycle? So one other additional thing, um, if you haven't dove into it, the Service Graph Connector has a, a, a view, um, a little data viewer. Absolutely love this. Uh, this is uh, really wonderful. If you can see here, I have uh, several sample Service Graph Connectors. They always start with an SG dash. Uh, one of them, uh, like Microsoft SCCM, for example, will bring in different data sources. So I'm bringing in software and network and disk, computer identity, et cetera. And if I click on one of these, what the visualization will do is pop in and show me um, all of the ways that it's pulling that data in. So might have to refresh my screen on this one. It's always the last thing. There we go. Uh, 
a little bit large screen, but uh, what it allows us to do is kind of see all the different areas that this data is coming in with. Uh, in this case, uh, if I look at computer identity, um, this is where it's doing its primary connection to identify where in this seem to be, we're actually connecting a computer record, for example. And then I look through individual, uh, let's say, let's say name, go with a simple one here. So what this allows me to do is visualize saying, we collect the data from the import, we actually have a temp, we have an operation, cleanse the computer name, maybe remove some data. There's automated processes we have within our service graph connectors and that you can leverage if you're building your own, uh, what we call uh, ETL or robust transform engine to bring in data as well. Um, and that allows you to apply some of our pre-built uh, operations against that. So cleaning, validating, et cetera. Uh, split out a computer name, maybe to just get the computer versus the fully qualified domain name. And then we end up populating the seem to be with this. So if this one's, if you want to go through and identify how things are done and how things are populating your seem to be, this is a great way to do it. Source native key is a great example where we're bringing in multiple details and pulling that together into one field. So a little bit of a tidbit, it's pretty popular. Um, and again, when we start bringing in many different data sources, um, this gives us an ability to look through to see exactly how they're bringing the data in, um, where that ends up being, being mapped into the seem to be. I would leverage my CI class manager within our seem to be to be able to reconcile and create roles to say, uh, I want to have this source populate this field. I want to have this other source populate another field. And recently, we, we enhanced that to actually keep the last payload from each one of these data sources. So if later on you change your reconciliation rules and you actually say, I want to have a different data source populate a given field, um, we'll actually process that for you without having to wait for another job run. Um, we'll go ahead and take that last payload we're storing and update all of those records for you. So you have a very granular level of control field by field class by class about what uh, sources are populating those fields. So I wanted to stop there, uh, make sure we have plenty of time for q and I have one or two more slides as well. So Christian, this is Andy. I've got a couple of questions. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna machine gun them to you and you can uh, answer. You ready? Yeah, sure. All right, number one, is there any normalization that occurs between the multiple data sources? Um, we do normalize some fields. So software, for example, we do normalize. Um, we don't normalize um, things like operating system. You're, you're picking one field um, to be able to identify uh, which populates that field. So essentially, you end up with one, one winner to populate that field. In the new SeemDB workspace, though, we do identify where there is a mismatch. Uh, there was a tag there that said mismatch CIs. Um, that is going to identify for you where two different data sources have a different value for that same CI. Um, and we do have a normalization plugin. So you could leverage that if you wanted to. Generally speaking, you're evaluating the data to see which one has the more accurate data and you'll leverage that. You can also use our reconciliation staleness rule that says, I will take a lower quality of data, um, let's say a CCM, uh, if nothing else is available. But if discovery has populated that field, I'd like for that to overwrite it. Uh, however, if discovery hasn't seen it, hence the staleness rule for let's say seven days or 30 days or whatever time period, then our rule actually allows you to go back and allow the lower ranking uh, to overwrite that file, uh, that field as well. So there is some sophistication there, um, but we don't try to normalize all of your uh, sources of data just because there would be too many. Okay. Um, and uh, next question was the, the current example that you're walking through all the different data that you found in there. Would, would that have been you know, I know that you loaded it in, but is it a, would, could you have received that from both the agent client collector and the agent list client and the agent list method? Yeah, yeah. So that that uh, reconciliation occurs in the sense that we can uh, enrich a CMDB record. Uh, I, I We have precedent for that for asset management as well. Think about our standard use case where maybe you have an uh, integration into an asset management system. It populates our asset management tables uh, that's where you're going to get contract data. That's where you're going to get model data. That's where you're going to get uh, information that's specific to that. But it's hardware. It's not yet maybe installed in a rack and it's maybe not plugged into a network. And if it's a server, maybe it doesn't have an operating system on it. So there's data that's missing. However, uh, if it meets our classification uh, correct, it would actually create a CI record. This is out of the box. A configuration item record will be created in reference back to that asset. It's going to have some data and maybe it doesn't have host name. Maybe it doesn't have uh, operating system. But perfectly fine when discovery runs, when our agent runs, when service graph connectors run, what they'll do is they'll identify with our seem to be identifiers, um, the, the, I, uh, the 
uh, serial number, for example, if it's hardware or the uh, UUID or the, the cloud reference item or wh whatever it might be, um, identify that that is the record. That's how we avoid duplicates. And then we'll enhance that record. Um, that happens on every se subsequent run as well. So maybe we start off with a stub record that really only has a little bit of information from the hardware side, but then discovery comes and says, well, that's actually Linux server and reclasses it. And here's the IP and here's the fully qualified domain name. and Here's the software that's installed and here's the network adapters and the IP addresses. Uh, and so that's how we enrich that record. And then uh, service graph connectors might come in and say um, that they have some additional data as well. Uh, and that's how you get that full enriched picture uh, of everything related to that configuration item. Okay, that's that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, and so, two more questions, and then we can you can do the final. You know, because we're about seven minutes. So, two more questions. Can the agent also scan and find information uh, about applications on a mainframe? So, can we load the agent onto a mainframe? Uh, we generally speaking wouldn't see the agents on a mainframe. I know there are mainframes out there that are uh, Unix based, Linux based, and so you know there might be a gray area there. But generally speaking, we partner. Uh, we have a company out there, a partner that we work with. Um, feel free to reach out to your ServiceNow uh, representatives or, or, or to Andy and myself, and we can we can make an introduction. Um, they actually have a really great service graph connector that ties in a mainframe agent that they have uh, that collects that data. And they get into a much more granular level to, to mainframes, more specifically jobs. Uh, I don't really care about mainframe as much from the hardware perspective. I care if the jobs are running or not. Uh, and this particular partner has also tied that into service mapping. So they actually map out all of those jobs in that the, the, the service to job to, to mainframe hardware, uh, as well as pull in alerts as well when things fail. So probably recommend them for that. I mean, that's the same thing if we think about uh, network infrastructure, storage infrastructure, uh, agents are gonna be able to be installed on those. They're really operating system based. That's pretty usual for you. If you're dealing with agents with any other uh, platform. Uh, so we're probably looking at a combination for you to get that full picture of your environment of doing a combination of horizontal discovery, uh, which is going to capture all of those devices that are on the network, as well as agent based discovery that might be reporting back from an operating system based server or desktop or laptop. And then finally, Christian, do you know if all of this information um, is covered? Will, will, will all this information be covered in the military skill bridge cohort? Oh, you stumped me on that one, but we can. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know that either. So I will find I will find that out, and I will get that information out uh, to you, Troy. So appreciate the question. Um, yeah, that's great. Yep. So okay. So I just sent a note to somebody also internally. So if I get it before the end of this, Troy, I'll let you know. Um, and so, Kristen, if you want to kind of do the final slide and and wrap up. Yeah, I just want to summarize. So we weren't able uh, to show everything today. I, I, I think I probably showed too much, my apologies, but uh, IT operations management visibility also gives you licenses to um, and features to, to do certificate management. So certificate, certificate inventory and management allows us to bring in uh, the certificates that are installed on your servers uh, and actually allow us to call out to those certificate authorities, identify when something might be expiring. And then we have processes that you can follow that will allow you to automatically uh, revoke renew uh, and, and even workflows if you want to install those um, or those can go to tasks and have somebody this helps a lot you know there's no reason for anybody to have any outages or anything down because of an expired certificate um, it's all built into the platform here so uh, really enjoy that that's a very popular feature uh, firewall auditing and reporting as well also a wonderful feature that allows us to do uh, a pull in a firewall from Palo Alto um, we can actually see the firewall rules and then what it allows us to do is allow users to submit through our catalog process the request of a new firewall rule and then we task that through that whole process so that's really wonderful tag governance um, so anything that's in the cloud for example that has tag that allows us to identify whether or not um, those tags exist maybe we have a standard policy or something uh, and uh, those tags are really helpful we can do service mapping based on tags as well didn't have time to show that today but that allows us to say if we have some standardized tags uh, then when uh, we have cloud deployments they're going to follow that tag standard and as we read those tags in, it'll allow us to go through and populate them together in a service in a more automated fashion. Uh, as a customer, I'll just let you know, way before ServiceNow uh, you know, had this as an out of the box feature, I went ahead and built that myself. So we did have the ability to pull in tags and I went one step further. I not only used it to create services uh, where they're more modern and, and, and refactored in the cloud, uh, but I also use tags to populate fields. So when I said earlier that our discovery out of the box does not populate undiscoverable fields like ownership or 
um, environment, production or QA, I pulled those in with tags and I populated those fields. So I drove automation as far as I could. Uh, and then obviously from a population perspective, we covered some of this. I talked about that multi-source aware CMDB, that service mapping that allows you to do tag-based, machine learning-based. I showed those recommendations where it's actually letting you preview a map. That's absolutely brilliant. I'm a big fan of that now. Um, and obviously leveraging our agent client collector for visibility to pull in data. Um, that also works very well for laptops. Um, so even if you don't want to do horizontal discovery for a laptop, um, if you want to augment uh, the service graph connectors that are out there, ACC are wonderful for those as well as servers. And again, all of the great service graph connectors, really big fan of that program. We have a lot of developers that are working very hard to make sure that those service graph connector teams, whether we design it, whether our partner designs it for us, um, that we are going through the proper process to make sure that it plays nicely, not only with other service graph connectors, but discovery agent client collector. Um, so now you can feel very confident going to that store, picking up multiple service graph connectors, having them report back about your environment and not have to worry about those duplicates as much. One thing I didn't cover today as well is what we call ACC V for air gap networks. If this applies to you, if you have enclaves that are not allowed to have connectivity whatsoever and everything's maybe a flat file, uh, talk to us. We do have some ability to provide ACC agents that run well, a little bit headless, if we wanna say, out in those environments. They actually report back into a flat file versus trying to do a network connection. That flat file can go through whatever process you need. And then we can read that flat file in and populate seem to be through that method if that applies to you. Something else I didn't show today was what we call investigation framework, brand new in Tokyo. Absolutely love this for your help desk. Imagine somebody calls in, you're working with somebody and uh, they have an issue. This allows you when there's an agent running on that uh, uh, caller's uh, laptop or desktop to report back to you as the service agent immediately what's going on there. Um, so as you can see here, CPU utilization, top processes, et cetera. And then this also allows you to run some workflows as well. So you can update software from this. You can run workflows that allow you to uh, maybe kill some processes so you can work with that user and actually help them to diagnose right from here without having to remote in. And then just to give you again that maturity map here, you know, going from an inventory level of discovery, understanding what's on your network to understanding the service awareness. And I start off with outcomes, be it change impact analysis, uh, be it uh, a service health uh, cost, et cetera. Having that service aware seem to be is really where we want to focus because that brings you a lot of value. And ultimately, if we build that out, that's the crawl phase in our common service data model approach. Common service data model is where we apply a data model on top of the seem to be about how the seem to be data is actually leveraged by different personas within ServiceNow and uh, within your organization. So that's where we, what we call here, fully realized outcome, where when we have that business and technical context, then we can make really good decisions based on the criticality, uh, whether or not, I think it's an example I showed earlier, where maybe we have uh, end of life hardware software, and we're making decisions based on how that uh, is contextual within a service. This is a critical service or not. This is a service we're going to migrate or not. We're making decisions on data, but based on that larger context. So hopefully this is a journey that you're interested in as well. Talk with us. We can go and share some, uh, some additional data. And uh, it was a pleasure having you spending some time with us. Yeah, thank you, Christian. And thank you, everybody, for staying. I know we're a little bit over. We really enjoyed it. Um, we'll get the information out to you. And, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we can, we're happy to answer any questions. So, uh, Heather, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, at this time, I'd like to just thank all of our participants as well as our speakers for being with us today. We hope the information you received during this webinar has been helpful. If you have any further questions or would like to request any more information, please feel free to reach out. That is all for today. Thank you, everybody, and have a good holiday season.